Welcome back. Well, it's that time. We're near the end, everyone. I hope you've taken away valuable information that will propel us forward into a brighter future. Now, and learn more about how these conversations are important. Our keynote speaker is not other than the 10th president of Morris State University, Dr. David Wilson. Now, I must say, in my estimation, Morgan State is the greatest HBCU. I must say that because I'm a graduate. <laughs> and I also must say, go Bears. <laughs> now, back to speech. Dr. Wilson has been a longtime friend of CCG and has overseen historical accomplishments at Morgan State University since his tenure in 2010. He came to Morgan State from the University of Wisconsin, where he was the chancellor of both the University of Wisconsin Colleges and the University of Wisconsin Extension. Before that, he held numerous positions in administrative posts in academia, including vice president for the university outreach and associate provost at Auburn University, also associate provost of Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. We are only two years into this new decade. Today, we get a glimpse of Dr. Wilson's unique perspective. And he talks about how HBCUs interact in this new decade and the changing roles that they face in the years to come. Everyone, it's my esteemed honor and privilege to welcome Dr. David Wilson. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for uh, those unbelievably kind words of introduction. Uh, I'm really honored, uh, beyond honored really, uh, to be a part of the uh, Bay of STEM Life uh, Leading Voices uh, STEM City USA gathering today. Uh, I understand that you have heard from some amazing uh, speakers uh, already. Um, and of course, uh, the challenge for me is <laughs> uh, the last of the day. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, you know, quite, quite uh, an honor uh, to be invited into the space. Uh, let me start by thanking Dr. Uh, Tyrone Taborn, uh, of course, for his amazing work uh, in STEM, amazing work in Bayer. Um, of course, um, before the pandemic, I was a frequent attendee at the Bay of Gatherings uh, and just came away so inspired and so motivated by uh, everything that was going on in this space that is being so uh, adroitly led by Dr. Tabor. So um, with that in mind, um, how might I shape my comments to you this afternoon? Uh, I, I thought I would do uh, primarily uh, three things. Uh, number one, uh, would take a few minutes um, and not take anything for granted, but just kind of give you a very, very high level overview of how this genre of institutions called historically black colleges and universities came into existence. Uh, and then I want to, after that, uh, zero in on the, um, uh, the diversity that we see across the HBCU genre, the diversity amongst the faculty, uh, and the student success piece. And basically, um, why are we seeing the results that we are seeing coming out, out of our institutions? And I think it is because of that incredibly diverse faculty that we have that is so tremendously dedicated. I talk a little bit about Morgan and our value proposition here, and then I give you a sense of this diversity of faculty across all HBCUs. Uh, and then uh, last, I want to end with some lessons that I think we have learned uh, here uh, at Morgan and some lessons that uh, I have learned personally as a person who's been in the higher ed space across so many different institutions um, as to, you know, what is it that um, other institutions can kind of learn from um, HBCUs with regard to the culture that we have in place to sustain uh, the diversity of the faculty and the kind of student success outcomes that we see. So uh, let me go back quickly and kind of put into context how the 107 or so HBCUs came into existence. I know we have students on this uh, seminar, and I know we have uh, industry leaders and others, and so I'll try and be as parsimonious, uh, stingy, <laughs> um, yet as uh, comprehensive as I can be. So um, the uh, first um, American uh, university or college that came into existence, of course, was Harvard University uh, in 1636. Um, I went to a Tuskegee undergrad, but I also have two degrees from Harvard. And so uh, I was uh, enamored with both the history of Tuskegee that came into existence in 1881, as well as Harvard in 1636. But from 1636 um, until roughly 1865, 
uh, you um, did not have many institutions uh, that uh, were on the landscape that served blacks in any way. Uh, you basically had about three. Uh, you had the first institution that came into existence to minister to the needs of black students in 1837. Uh, that was, of course, um, over 200 years after Harvard was established. Uh, and that institution was Cheney University outside of Philadelphia. And Cheney came into existence in 1837 as the Institute for Colored Youth. And then shortly after Cheney came into existence, uh, we had a few other institutions that also came into existence to serve Black students. Uh, Lincoln University, that is interestingly enough, located in the next county over from Cheney outside of Philadelphia. Uh, Lincoln came into existence in 1854 to serve Black men. And then later, Wilberforce University in Ohio uh, came into existence two years later in 1856. And by the way, Wilberforce was the only one of these early private church-related HBCUs that was um, operated uh, by Blacks. The others were not. And so then um, as the country was coming to the end of the Civil War, uh, there was a recognition that uh, those Ivy League institutions, uh, Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Penn and all of those institutions, uh, that was not the future of America. If America was going to be competitive, if America was going to grow as a nation, that it needed a different set of institutions that concentrated, if you will, on some of the things that this conference has been about. Uh, it wanted a group of A and T or A and M universities. And so there's a piece of federal legislation that was introduced at the time called the Morrill Act of 1865, or 1860. And, and, and that act, uh, 1865, I'm sorry, that act brought into existence all of these big A and T, A and M institutions, um, Texas A and M, the University of Florida, Auburn University, all of those institutions came into existence, and they came into existence to pretty much have degrees in, in engineering or technology, in home economics, and in agriculture. And that was supposed to be uh, the way that America would be developed. Well, guess what? Uh, even though those institutions were supported by federal tax dollars, uh, none of those states required those institutions to accept black students. These are all public institutions. And so rather than require them to do that, those states then created the beginning of separate but equal, so-called separate but equal. And they then passed legislation in 1890 to bring into existence a smaller group of public black colleges also with an A N T A N M mission to serve the needs of black students. And that's how we got institutions like North Carolina a and Alabama a and Florida a and those institutions. And so that is kind of a quick kind of overview of why this set of institutions that we know as HBCUs came into existence. They came into existence because there was no genre of colleges and universities in this country that would open their doors to Blacks, especially the sons and daughters of newly freed slaves, with any kind of increased volume. And so with that, let me now move to and make one critical point here, that when you look at this overview of higher education, an honest overview would reveal, and let me speak very slowly and carefully here, that HBCUs are the only group of institutions that came into existence in this particular time period, you know, from 1636 until, oh, 1865 and, um, and 1890 that did not exclude anyone. They did not come into existence, if you will, to promote racism uh, or to exclude anyone based on their race. Uh, many of these institutions were actually established by whites and white congregations. Uh, and 
many of them had uh, predominantly, I mean, overwhelmingly, almost majority white faculties, uh, staff. Uh, and so the institutions were very, very inclusive from their beginning. And so with that, I do have a few slides that I want to show you now, just kind of zeroing in on uh, models of faculty diversity and student success, because when most people think about uh, HBCUs, uh, they don't really talk enough, in my view, uh, about the role of the faculty. The faculty of these institutions are very diverse. They are so committed to the overall success of the students. Uh, they, in the vernacular, uh, have, um, have, have, have really consumed, if you will, uh, the, um, the, the special DNA of the institutions. Um, and that is really something that is very special and has been built into the culture of the institution. And as a result of that, that has led to the kind of student success that we see here at Morgan and across the HBCU world, particularly in STEM fields. And so uh, let me go to uh, my next slide here. And so at Morgan, we always start with our vision. These are our core values at the institution. And we put those just as many HBCUs do on our campuses so that everyone is aware of leader, L-I-I-D-E-R, le leadership, innovation, integrity, diversity, excellence, and respect. This is who we are at Morgan, and we're not apologetic about it. And we are um, uh, the state of Maryland's preeminent public urban research university, born in the HBCU tradition, uh, but we are known here for excellence in everything we do. We embrace excellence in teaching and research and service and, and the preparation of our graduates to go out and dance on the world stage with anyone, any place, anytime, anywhere. And so in terms of our student body, we have uh, roughly 8,500 students here hailing from 40 states and about 65 countries. Uh, you can see that um, the, the breakdown in terms of uh, women uh, versus men, um, African-American, um, that, that's about 70 percent. Um, and then uh, Hispanic, 2 uh, percent white, uh, in essence, 10 uh, percent international. Uh, and so that's how the 8,500 uh, students would actually demographically look. Um, we are offering now about 145 academic degree programs here at Morgan, uh, from the baccalaureate degree, of course, to the doctoral degree. Uh, and these are our top 10 undergraduate programs in terms of popularity, in terms of enrollment, if you will. You can see engineering is right there, uh, electrical engineering. I'll say a little bit more about that. Computer science, uh, business administration, civil engineering. Uh, and then at the graduate level, you can see engineering also is very popular here at Morgan, uh, as well as bioenvironmental sciences, uh, business administration, and some of the other programs as well. Uh, and so, um, we always say here that you have to really understand what your value proposition is, and you cannot be hesitant uh, in um, putting that value proposition in front of everyone, the state legislature in our cases, uh, our, our, our private partners, uh, our, our, um, our just you know, our university community so that everyone is aware. So when it comes to the production of African-American graduates, in the state of Maryland. This is how Morgan stacks up. We are number one in producing African-American graduates. And then we're number one in uh, uh, number two and number three in these fields, in journalism, in engineering, in architecture, in civil engineering, in electrical engineering, industrial engineering, finance, marketing, chemistry. And so you can see here that we understand how valuable we are to the contemporary and long-term competitiveness of the state of Maryland in terms of our graduates. But we also understand the same thing with regard to nationally how we rank amongst all institutions for you in the nation. And so we are number one in the nation in awarding African-Americans degrees in electrical engineering, uh, number one in industrial engineering, number two in civil engineering. You can see here, this is in the nation in terms of the value proposition of Morgan. And so Bayer, of course, is concentrating on STEM um, as it rightly should because of the paucity of representation in that field. And we are saying that HBCUs, Morgan and others, and I'll show you how HBCUs writ large are, are contributing to this enormous talent gap in the STEM areas. 
Um, but these are our national rankings with regard to baccalaureate degree production. And then you go to the master's degrees nationally in the nation. You can see um, a continuation of the strong um, uh, 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 output on the part of Morgan. Uh, and then uh, for the doctoral degrees in engineering in the country, Morgan is ranked number nine amongst all universities in the country offering uh, doctoral degrees in engineering when it comes to the production of um, African-Americans. Now, I started by saying, OK, so when you go back and look at the way HBCUs came into existence, um, they have always embraced diversity um, as a part of the culture of the institution. We never, if you will, uh, created a culture uh, that was non-welcoming uh, to faculty um, and uh, to students. You know, uh, white students, of course, never uh, came to the institutions in, in droves, but that was because of choice. It was not because there was any law preventing them from doing that, just as there is no law preventing them from doing it today. So with that said, um, when, it, when it comes to faculty diversity, Morgan is one of the most diverse institutions in the country. Um, and I, I just I want to show a bit about the faculty here. Because once again, I don't think the faculty across all of our HBCUs get the kind of credit that they should. They should be absolutely honored for the incredible way uh, in which they take students wherever those students are and move them to a point where they, when they walk across those stages and they get their sheepskins, they are ready to go out there as the innovators, uh, as the inventors, as fill in the blank. They understand that they have to have a skill set that will enable them to be the leaders that our cities and our states and our nation actually is demanding. And so we have 579 um, headcount faculty. We are, uh, are recruiting now 80 uh, additional tenure tenure track faculty here at the university uh, over the next two years. Um, we, we, you know, we have 428 full-time faculty and 300 and uh, uh, 23 a uh, tenure tenure track faculty. Those faculty members are the ones that usually stay at the institution once they are tenured uh, for oh, 30, 35 years. And you can see here uh, the uh, demographics of our faculty in terms of gender representation here, um, in terms of um, racial uh, representation as well. 41 percent or so of our faculty are African American, so the largest percent of our faculty by by a long shot uh, are African American. 20 percent international, uh, and then 16 percent are white and uh, Native American and others uh, are represented in that group as well. Several faculty members um, here at Morgan are. Um, globally ranked, as you'll see across the HBCUs. Um, and so I've asked myself, as I looked across um, uh, many of our institutions, and I don't think that uh, what I put here in terms of Morgan is any different than what you will find at many of the other campuses. Why is it that HBCUs are really not struggling with what many TWIs are struggling with? And it is this whole, you know, you know, D, you know diversity, equity, and inclusion piece. Um, because once again, our foundations were built very, very differently than those institutions. And so when it's baked into your founding that you are founded on a diverse foundation, which I argue we were, uh, and these institutions have always been diverse, they don't struggle with that in the kinds of ways. And the faculty on the HBCU campuses are empowered uh, to really kind of follow their inquiry. Uh, and uh, to engage in meaningful academic in endeavors, to, that they are expected to form special relationships with students, special bonding with students. Um, they are expected, if you will, to um, work with uh, students in their laboratories and to show them uh, paths to success uh, that perhaps um, they are not readily uh, seeing. Uh, and then, um, of course, um, mentoring. We take that very, very seriously at the institution uh, and try and put our faculty in positions where they are being mentored by those who've been in the space for a while. And, 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 and the, the second bullet here um, is, is so critical. And so I, I said that the college sit-in movement actually started here at Morgan only to show that Institutions like Morgan, institutions like North Carolina A&T, institutions like Tuskegee, institutions like Fisk, those institutions um, actually um, are, are activist institutions. I mean, they came into existence uh, to enable um, America to uh, 
uh, basically live up to the ideals embedded in the Constitution, uh, that everyone was created equal, but yet the nation was not showing them that they were. And so, uh, therefore, these institutions uh, were uh, simply uh, uh, there to say, mm, if this is what we are about as a nation, then you have to show us representation within that Constitution. And so this kind of uh, strong sense of, uh, of, of doing the right thing, of pushing you know, for inclusion uh, uh, in, in a larger sense, in a national sense, uh, is a part of our DNA. Um, there's also a strong sense of community across HBCUs, where um, even based on the recent story in the front page of the New York Times um, two Sundays ago, uh, there really is a sense of family on the campuses, right? Um, and you know, it doesn't matter in, 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 form, in, in the case of students or in, in particular, it doesn't matter which high school you went to. It doesn't matter what state you're from. It does not matter. What matters is that you are now in an environment where every single day the message is, I belong. People care about me. And, not, and, and, and as a result, they have raised this bar so high and have put in place the faculty support the staff support, they have created a culture where students can support each other. If there's a student organization that students want to, if they look across all of our institutions and they see student organizations uh, and they don't see one that they feel comfortable joining, they basically found their own organization. Um, and, and, and then um, amongst the faculty, there's a strong commitment to students of color, uh, and more importantly, um, faculty across HBCUs, they, they know each other, they respect each other. And so let's look at the data now across all HBCUs. So um, uh, this um, is, is, is um, uh, about a decade old, but um, I looked at the most recent data and it's increased um, about six or seven percentage points. But I just want to give you the sense that when you are talking about doctoral degree recipients in STEM, where did those individuals get their undergraduate degree? And basically, this is National Science Foundation uh, data here that I'm looking at. It's been updated. And so you can see here that HBCUs are responsible um, for right now, it's like 33% uh, of all Blacks with PhDs in STEM fields in terms of where they receive their undergraduate degree. Now, understand that you're only talking about 107 schools, and there's like 4,000 universities, uh, colleges, and universities in the United States. And so you have roughly 3% of that group that is turning out 33% of Black undergraduates who go on to get PhDs. Uh, Dr. Shirley Malcolm, who is a member of my Board of Regents here at Morgan and uh, is um, affiliated with uh, the American uh, Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, she is basically out there saying, you know, if we didn't have institutions like HBCUs, it would be a crisis in the country with regard to producing Blacks in STEM fields. And we would be in a discussion right now in terms of, you know, how do we create institutions uh, that can make sure that the population in the United States that is rapidly becoming more diverse is not left out of these STEM pipelines. That's what HBCUs are doing, and this is what they have done uh, over the decades and over the centuries. Now, let's get down to where the rubber meets the road, and this is where, um, when you look at the the top 50 undergraduate institutions in the United States in terms of black science and engineering doctorates, where did they go to undergrad? The top 50. The top 10 are all HBCUs. You got Howard Spellman, Florida A&M, Hampton, Xavier, Morehouse, Morgan, North Carolina A&T, Southern, Tuskegee, the top 10 of those institutions of the 50 uh, in terms of the production of black S and E doctorates in terms of where they went to undergrad school are all HBCUs. There are 21 institutions, among almost 50% uh, 
of the institutions in the top 50 are all HBCUs. <laughs> and so uh, we have a very, very strong value proposition uh, where uh, there are certain things that are just baked into our DNA uh, and uh, baked into the culture of the institution. And you can see here, I just took um, examples in four areas, in the life sciences, in the physical sciences, the social sciences, and in engineering, and looked at the top 10 institutions in terms of black alums from baccalaureate institutions in these four fields who went on to get PhDs. And you can see here in terms of life sciences, there's only one non-HBCU in that group at the time coming in at number five, and that's um, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Everybody else is an HBCU in the life sciences and the physical sciences. There's no traditionally white institution in this group in terms of the um, uh, where uh, blacks who receive PhDs uh, receive their undergraduate degrees in terms of the ranking. In the social sciences, um, yes, we have you know, Harvard there at, at number five and then Berkeley at number six and uh, et cetera. But then look at um, uh, the other five uh, also. And then in engineering, um, you, you know, North Carolina A&T uh, followed by FAMU and Morgan and then uh, Howard and uh, Tuskegee. And so once again, uh, these institutions are, are punching well above their weight uh, with regard to being the drivers uh, of graduates who are interested in pursuing STEM careers um, at the undergraduate level, who are interested in pursuing STEM PhDs to work in laboratories with corporations or the federal government, uh, or to be in a position uh, to ensure that there is a diverse faculty across higher education in these critical fields. And so when you look across the HBCU landscape at uh, the, the faculty members who are in the tenure tenure track, um, it's roughly 9,000 or so, you can see that our institutions as well embrace gender balance. Um, and you know it's, it's about a 10% gap there, but when you look across, if you, you look at that same measure in terms of gender across uh, many of the other institutions, um, this particular gap is, um, is, 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 is narrower. Um, in, in, ter in terms of uh, the percent of faculty that are African-American, uh, over half, and then you can see uh, the rest of the diversity of the faculty across all of the HBCUs. And so um, the long and short of it here, as I um, uh, kind of come to about uh, three or four more slides and I'll conclude, uh, is that uh, there are roughly 107 HBCUs in the United States, enrolling over 280,000 students. Uh, and over 80% of them are four-year colleges and universities. Uh, and uh, black graduates of HBCUs, as I've indicated, uh, are more likely than black graduates of other institutions to be thriving. This is a, a survey that was conducted um, a few years ago about the Lumino Foundation, and um, I, I, I can't think of the polling firm, um, uh, but um, that they're, they're, they're more, you know, that they're happier, they're stronger, they are consistent and progressing uh, in a number of their lives, particularly in terms of their financial well-being and their purpose. And then um, we're doing all of this um, with, the, <laughs> uh, with um, very, very meager uh, investments um, in our institutions. And just by comparison, uh, if the endowments of all HBCUs, all 107, were added up, uh, they'll still be less than 10%, less than 10% of the endowment of just one institution, uh, Harvard. Uh, and so there's still just an incredible uh, thirst for more philanthropic investment uh, and a more federal investment and more state investment uh, in our institutions in order to bring them closer to parity. Um, we um, uh, have basically, in a lot of instances, just taken what we had uh, and we have made what we needed in order for our students to be well prepared and to thrive once they leave our doors. Uh, I, I've covered this before, um, but um, I, I do want to um, kind of share with you, if you will, um, just the way in which undergraduates uh, in, uh, in, in STEM fields uh, have uh, moved forward and have gotten uh, those PhDs. So, uh, roughly um, a, a third, as I indicated or so, 
uh, have um, done their undergraduate degrees at HBCUs and doctoral degrees uh, at, um, um, at, at uh, PWIs. And, um, and, and then the, uh, that's, that's, did I say that correctly? Um, it's an undergraduate degree at HBCU and doctoral degrees at a PWI, and, and then undergraduate degrees at uh, and doctoral degrees at, H, at, at HBCU. So you put that 26% with the 9%, um, and then um, you, that's where you get the 30, um, 30, 35% um, of individuals um, who are being produced by these institutions. Uh, and so uh, just a few takeaways here, um, if you will. Um, and so it, here's sort of what I have. Um, learned since I have been the president here at Morgan now for uh, 12 years uh, next week, <laughs> um, is that um, HBCUs played a long game. And, and so um, we start uh, the moment we accept the student, um, planning to see their number one, uh, you're going to be successful uh, at Morgan. HBCUs overall, you're going to be successful here. And we're going to work with you hand in glove to make that happen. And a part of that success uh, is to make sure that you complete what you started in the STEM fields. And then that you start thinking about grad school and you basically get in a position where we're gonna support you along the way to get there. Um, and uh, also um, uh, we uh, would not you know, be um, uh, showing the statistics that we are showing across um, the uh, in, in entire menu of HBCUs uh, if uh, we did not have as a part of our culture, uh, a very, once again, inclusive, supportive, belonging environment, you know, where student intellectual development and community elevation, you know, those are the primary drivers of this culture. Um, I, I do think that there is an opportunity or a tremendous opportunity uh, for uh, many of us to expand our collaborations with uh, TWIs uh, to do some uh, three plus, you know, master's program, uh, PhD programs, uh, three plus one or two master's programs. Um, we, of course, are pursuing these partnerships with Purdue University, with Carnegie Mellon University, and, um, and, and, and a few others, and we think they show a lot of promise. And this next piece here um, is um, a very, very serious takeaway. Um, uh, we have been looking a lot at um, the Carnegie ranking of institutions, and you know, it's this Carnegie system, but, R1 is a very high research university, R2 is high research, and R3 is moderate research. And so when I came on board here at Morgan 10 years ago, we were moderate research, we were R3, and we wanted to move to R2 and become high research. And so we achieved that in 2018. And so now we really have our eyes set on becoming a very high research institution and joining uh, the 160 or so very high research institutions in this country. There's no HBCU. Uh, that is an R1. Uh, there are 10 of us uh, that are R2s, and uh, those include institutions like Morgan and Howard and North Carolina A&T and Florida A&M, uh, Tennessee State, uh, Clark Atlanta University, uh, Prairie View, uh, Texas Southern. These are the R2s. Um, we have looked at um, where uh, every one of the 10 HBCUs is in uh, reaching a very high research uh, status. Um, and we are right there. We, we, we think that um, there are about three or four of us uh, that are within striking distance and that within uh, three to five years, uh, you'll see uh, a few HBCUs on that penthouse uh, of research activity. Now, this is very important because, you know, we want to make sure that our undergraduate students here at Morgan, uh, while they are being prepared in these STEM fields and you'll find the same across uh, the uh, other HBCUs as well, uh, that they are, um, you know, they are in the laboratory um, working uh, directly uh, with professors who are generating the new knowledge in these fields. Uh, so for example, um, with uh, this aim toward very high research status, um, we have been able to get the state of Maryland now to fund um, four separate research centers with ongoing appropriation. Uh, and one of those centers that we will be announcing in a robust way soon uh, is uh, the Center for Equitable Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning. We looked across the country 
and we don't see another institution out there that we think is can bring to the table um, a way of teasing out um, implicit bias in these algorithmic agri uh, systems that are being developed in a way that Morgan and perhaps a few other HBCUs can. And so the state um, has um, uh, agreed to fund this center um, starting July 1 of this year at $3.1 million per year in perpetuity. Uh, and we uh, also um, took to the state another proposal uh, to start a research center here um, in um, um, the Internet of Things, um, uh, uh, cybersecurity. Um, the state responded, you know, 2.1 million year over year. Uh, we um, now have the uh, a PhD program uh, in this area and produced the first graduates last year. Uh, and so this is once again about how you strategically think about um, HBCUs, understanding where the talent gap is uh, and making the case to both, uh, in this case, uh, state government, as well as to uh, other potential partners uh, to partner with the institution and that we're going to bring to the table something of immense value. And consequently, our students are going to be even more prepared for a future that they will have to embrace. Uh, and so um, with that said, um, um, you know, in terms of um, uh, location, we do think that what we're seeing now um, across the landscape, particularly with regard to um, the national environment that we, um, we, we, we are saying to our students, got to get out there and prepare yourself to, to change, is that um, uh, faculty in particular now, they uh, really think twice about perhaps uh, being in hostile environments, you know, where the nature of their scholarship may be constantly under attack. Um, they want to be at institutions that um, give them um, the freedom to pursue that level of inquiry uh, and uh, <laughs> that don't stumble when it, it comes to academic freedom. Uh, and HBCUs have always been about that. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and therefore, um, we think we'll be much more successful uh, in continuing to attract the faculty that will enable us uh, to continue to produce the outcomes uh, that we have uh, produced. Uh, and so, um, and so uh, you know, the takeaway is, um, is, is that if um, you did not have um, HBCUs uh, engaged in a way that we are engaged, um, the nation states will have to figure out you know, how to make that happen. Um, now, my concluding uh, comment here uh, is that uh, we also you know, have uh, developed um, sustaining partnerships uh, with uh, corporations from uh, the Silicon Valley to um, all over the United States. Um, and those corporations now are uh, in partnership with the university with regard to internships, uh, with regard to investing in some of our laboratories. Um, even with um, uh, Google initially, um, we had a partnership where we had a Google in residence. We had that Google in residence for about seven years. Um, that person came to Morgan and uh, taught um, classes in uh, the Python language, very, very popular um, uh, classes, if you will. Uh, and then that started a dialogue of uh, Morgan actually uh, being able to provide an, on an ongoing basis several interns to Google. Uh, Facebook got jealous and, and said, well, we want to do the same thing. And so uh, then Facebook uh, had a pilot program with Morgan and I believe uh, UC Santa Barbara and um, San Jose State, I believe, uh, where it, it, it wanted to model that program and have a Facebooker in uh, residence. And so we've done that. Um, we also uh, have um, incredible partnerships with you know, places like Intel and Lockheed Martin and Norfolk Grumman and um, of Microsoft and you know just all of these institutions uh, that understand that um, if, for example, um, you are interested in diversifying your workforce, if you're interested in uh, having talent uh, that um, understands innovation, uh, that can come in and help your company to be extraordinarily competitive um, in this space, um, look at uh, HBCUs. I look at the institutions on the engineering side um, that only have four credited ABET 
I'm sorry, uh, that there are 14 accredited a ABET programs um, at HBCUs, and there are over, what, 400 or so uh, nationally. But those 14 uh, are producing, depending on which survey you look at, um, over 35 to 40 percent of, of all Blacks in engineering. <laughs> and so as um, I started to have these conversations with C-suite executives, particularly in the Silicon Valley, um, and they invited me out to have a conversation of several years ago with um, the three other HBCU presidents. Um, I recall in their closed door conversation, um, the comment was made that, you know, we're having a real hard time finding, you know, black engineers. Um, and when we kind of peeled back the onion a little bit, the conversation got real <laughs> um, and, um, and, 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 and an analogy uh, was put on the table. And, uh, it was one that stayed with me and it said, well, look, uh, let me see if I'm hearing what you are saying to us, um, that you want to diversify your workforce. Uh, however, uh, you're only recruiting from six or seven schools. Uh, and those schools collectively may be producing, oh, 25 black engineers. And you think that that's the way you're going to ultimately get to some kind of critical mass. Well, think about it this way and I have to use a football analogy because that's the one that was used in the room, that suppose you had the best quarterback in the NFL and that best quarterback was going up against the best defense in the NFL. But before the game, you taped one eye of the quarterback and then you said to the quarterback, now go out and win the game. What are the chances you think that will happen if the quarterback can only see one half the field. And people, it was like an epiphany. Well, absolutely. Well, if we're producing 40% of the engineers and you want to diversify the workforce, well, it seems to me that you gotta take the tape off the other eye and look at this incredible body of institutions with the incredible brilliant talent that we are producing. And so, with that said, uh, let me once again uh, thank Bea uh, for this opportunity um, that is bringing together um, the uh, STEM uh, Life um, uh, Leading Voices uh, series and the uh, um, STEM City USA. Um, this is a great platform uh, in order to have these conversations. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have been invited to share with you uh, this afternoon. Uh, and I'll be more than happy to address any questions if you have those of me. And so, uh, Mr. McKinney, do I need to throw this back to you for moderation? Um, but I'll, I'll be more than happy to um, address any questions that may come my way. And I don't think I can see the chat here if there are any questions in the chat. Wow, what an incredible summit, everyone. We can't thank you enough for tuning in and why did history unfold? If you want to participate in more history making events, be sure to register for the upcoming WAC STEM conference from October 6th through 8th, 2022, held on the WAC STEM DTX platform and live also in Detroit, Michigan. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, moderators. And also a huge thanks to the Federal Bureau of Investigation for sponsoring us today. Also, if you missed the US Black Engineers Magazine, 2022 top supported reveal list. Stay tuned because we're playing a replay of the reveal. You were all truly inspirational. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great night and a wonderful weekend.